I'm Susan Carol Bozer. And I'm Mike Guinan, and welcome to AI and Automation. Are you ready? Are you ready? So why us this morning? Uh, you know, there's four quadrants on this, and Michael and I are a team. On the left-hand side, it's me. So I am the CIO of White Castle. I love technology. I've been doing technology for well over 30 years, and I, I love the change, right? You can't be in technology if you don't love the change. So to me, I'm here to help you with the change. But also, I love data. It's probably truly my first love is data, because data has all the answers for you. So as you build things, as you create your companies, more and more data that my peers can bring to you, the better your products are going to be. And then Michael, Susan does different. love data. I can confirm that. She loves her data. Um, Mike Einan, VP of Operations Services, 39 years with White Castle this month, and started when I was 16 years old. And I spent the first 35 years of my career in the restaurants, growing up in the restaurants. So I've held every position from team member through vice president of restaurant operations. And then about f almost four years ago, I transitioned into my current title, which is VP of Operations Services. And so what does that mean? So I get to, obviously, I have the destination castles. I get to kind of lead the restaurant initiatives on our work plan. And some of the, 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 some of the departments that report up through me, one most importantly is construction. So I get to now have a seat at the table that talks about what do our kitchens look like and what do they need to look like as we move forward. So it's really been a gift for me to come from the restaurant side and now have an influence on the construction and what the castle looks like moving forward. And the remodels and all the stuff. The remodels, there. absolutely. So another thing that we are is manufacturing. I know you guys know White Castle, the fast food company, or QSR company, but we're also, we also manufacture. Right, so we have our own, our own meat plants, our bun factories, and we have a retail division in which we produce the items that we sell in, in the grocery stores and things of that nature. So robotics has been part of the White Castle world for many years. Right, and, so the, and that's the other thing we, that we bring to the table to talk to you this morning, is we actually have lived in the robot world for a very long time. If you look over on the left-hand side, you'll see this is a robot that actually uses computer vision. I'll talk about that in a minute. So it's not just a robot that you have to throw everything at exactly the same over and over again. It's a, a, a robot that can actually adapt to unforeseen circumstances, which is a really neat thing about robotics. So as we go through it, we're going to kind of go in this direction. This is our agenda. We're going to talk about AI in our restaurants. Everybody here cares about the spaces of restaurants, so we're really going to focus on the AI that focuses on that spaces and the, the impact that AI is going to have on those designs in the future. So, you know, designs of the future, that's really important. We are currently in the process of trying to find a partner, the best partner that's going to help us understand what our castles, we call them castles in the kitchen, and the customer experience, that journey, what does that need to look like? We continue to build the same castle, and we continue to get the same result, which means it's just not working for us any longer. So we really need to really dive into what does the customer want, how do we give the best experience for the customer and our team members, and how do we really get everyone to foster the change? The change within the castles, the change within leadership, and the change within the folks within our, within our home office to foster and embrace the change that needs to happen. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically give you our lessons learned and give you a lot of things to take away for you to think about in your businesses. So AI will change everything. That's a very dramatic statement. Um, I probably, if we had, when we were asked to do this presentation a few months ago, um, it was not, um, it would have been a harder sell for me, but now that you all, half of you raised your hand for J <laughs> chat PPT, and there's been a lot of news around AI, you be, I think all of you are beginning to realize that, that it's coming. It has been coming. It's been coming for 15 to 20 years. It's not, it's all, all through all, all of our robotics, all of our businesses. So we're going to focus on a few of those things that are really going to affect our restaurants. The first one would be on, the first is robotics. And Michael will talk a lot about robotics in a while, but this is not just your grandpa's ro robots that we used to see in the 70s that were manufacturing our cars. These are robots that are able to make decisions, learn from things, protect humans, stay out of their way. Whenever I say that, somebody's going to think of Terminator, but that's not true. Stop that. I saw your face already. Next is conversational AI. So the idea of being able to take an order, but also adapt to what the customer says. So it's an intelligent conversation. Um, that's really taking, at least from the QSR limited service side of restaurants, taking it to, to storm. But think about that idea of even being able to answer a phone and take an order. It does not have to be just in a drive through Then AI, IoT. So AI, IoT, IoT is Internet of Things. Very simple. If you don't know what that is, it just means connecting everything, everything to the Internet. That's all that means, Internet of Things. And why would you want to? You want to do it because of data. 
and we'll talk a lot about that later. And then computer vision. Computer vision is just using your cameras for what you really need them to do, which is see what you cannot see and interpret what you can't interpret. That's what computer vision is. And so we'll go through those a little bit later. So about three years ago now, we partnered with MasterCard. MasterCard came to us and they asked us to be their partner for um, our drive through AI. So our Alexa in the drive through And so we, we've named her Julia. And so Julia is currently in two castles getting ready to go into the third after about three years. And it's a great partnership, but it has really taken us a long time to get to where we are today. But I want to talk about, you know, why does operations want it? Labor, number one, right, let's call it what it is. We are struggling to get enough labor on the floor. It's, Julie is not taking a job away from anyone, and I think everyone in this room would agree with that. But beyond that, we partnered with, with uh, MasterCard prior to COVID, so we were already in this initiative. And it has really helped us for a couple things. Number one, it's a consistent customer experience. Number two, it's always trying to drive basket. Number three, it was funny because one of our crew managers said, Julia just went on to night shift. And the night shift crew manager made a comment. She said, oh my God, she just kept taking orders. <laughs> right? She just kept taking orders. She didn't stop taking orders. Because the AI, when you cross the loop detector, it automatically kicks on. You have your Julia experience and you pull on, pull forward. Our team members, obviously that's telling us that our team members can put customers on hold and pause them while they do something else. But AI always just continues to focus on the customer. And when we think about our drive-through person, drive-through customer service specialist that would take the order, that person has four to five jobs in most of our castles. Take the order, collect on the order, make the drink, get the order ready and hand it out. And now our mission for the company is to create memorable moments. So we've just relieved that person from taking the order which allows me to greet you at the window or the hospitality door and say, you had yada, 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 your total is this, how are you today? And it allows that little interaction to create that memorable moment, which is, our, our, which is what we have strive to do. Susan so going to talk about the, uh, the technology and the value proposition. Yeah, the, the technology behind it is natural language processing. So it is just like Michael said, Alexa, um, our partner SoundHound in this particular case, and there's lots of partners out there that are working in this space. And it really isn't, you know, it's really about learning the nuances of the way a person speaks, not particularly their accent. It's just the way of learning the nuances and the cadences and the ways they change orders. It's actually a very complicated way. If you talk to your car right now or, or even Siri on your phone, you know you have to speak in a particular way in order for, I say her, her to understand you. Um, in this particular case, we're trying to go beyond that. And that's why it's conversational AI because it is trying to have a conversation. What are our lessons learned on technology around this? You know, we really have to think about, you know, I will tell you on the technology side, compliance, thinking about privacy. This is a new realm that you are entering when you're doing voice type things, when you're doing any kind of biometric type thing, something to think about. And, I, and another lesson for us is we need, and I'm gonna say this over and over again for anybody who's on the construction side in this room, I need lots of cabling. So please make huge conduits for us out to the drive-thru. We're very needy, very needy in our, in our needs. Our, our second partnership, and actually they, they both start at the same time, is with Mesa Robotics. So Mesa Robotics approached us again about three plus years ago, and they had Flippy, but Flippy was in this cart. And Flippy was intended to do exactly that, flip hamburgers. And they came to us and they said, we really think we'd like to bring the technology to the drive through Can you help us? Would you be our partner for that? And so we now have Flippy, it's robot on a rail, so you really can't see it here, but the arm just goes back and forth on a rail above the, on, above the, behind the barrier. And White Castle has 11 different freezer to fryer menu items. Susan talked about computer vision. There's no more buzzers, no more timers. Everything's done through compu computer vision and computer learning. And Flippy is able to, through product identification, know exactly what, what he's picking up and what he's cooking. We currently have a hopper that holds two menu items for us. In most cases, it's french fries and maybe onion chips or chicken rings. And so Flippy is able to, we push a button, he goes over there and he gets the basket size we're asking for, and he cooks those. 
And that prevents the team member from having to do anything else other than just call for what, what the team member needs. These three bins um, that you're seeing there, those are auto bins. So the other nine menu items, freezer to fryer items, we put in the auto bin and there's a camera under each one of those. Flippy comes and takes it, cooks it for us, and then delivers it to us. Um, and all we have to do is package it. So in a lot of our castles, we've gone from having two team members, because our fryer line is kind of split. Sandwich items go to one way, um, sides that go to, the, go to the other direction, and now the flow of food all goes one way, which obviously makes a lot more sense within the restaurant. And we're able to take that second team member and repurpose them, right? Get them in the window to help make that favorable impression, help them expedite an order for speed of service. And so why does operations want this again? It's able to repurpose a body. Or when we are very short, one of the crew manager, one of the general managers said, I can always count on Flippy to be there. And I, I may have to turn around, drop some product, and Flippy takes it from there. And Flippy does everything else. It's consistency in cooking. So that we get the same product this all at the same time, consistently to the proper cook time and temperature. And Susan will kind of go through some of the value proposition and technology as well. You know, one of the things I think it's important, remember our manufacturing background as well. You know, we know that anytime you have a bottleneck, um, it, it is hurting your entire factory. Well, it's hurting our entire restaurants. Every time we have a bottleneck, our, our fryer had become our bottleneck. It, you know, you had to be an, almost an octopus to run the fryer. So our value proposition really was around taking care of a major bottleneck for us for both um, speed of service, but also for um, team member satisfaction. Uh, the technology behind it, you know, it's a smarter freezer, starting to do its own um, portion controlling for us, which I just love the idea of our industry having portion control. Our team members do not like doing portion control. If any of you are in my part of the industry, you know that they do not, or our part of the industry, you know they don't like using their scoops and things of the world. So it, it's really nice to have that part of the technology. And then there's cameras everywhere. I think we have eight cameras in there watching everything is happening, checking the temperature, the temperature is always perfect. It will let you know when something's out of order. It's a really good technology. And just, you, can we go back a little more, one a couple more things. So, um, Flippy's very safe. Mm -hmm. I think there's six different sensors that if you break that sensor, that barrier, Flippy stops right away. But where are we heading with Flippy? You know, we're working on, we're working to develop POS integration mm -hmm. where Flippy's gonna be able to drop certain items or hopefully all of them when we have hoppers that can hold more. He'll be able to drop the item based on the flow of business and in the history of the castle for that day. So that's, I thought that was important to share. Yeah, any... actually try to get ahead of it, absolutely. And we do product projection now, but whether the people cook to the projection is always, especially when they're really busy, is always the hardest thing. Right, and you know, if you think about a castle that doesn't have Flippy, during, during any time, but during peak time in particular, we have someone there managing six baskets, and they're, they're doing something, a task that's it's very challenging to do. You have to really be very talented to work that fryer area, and you also have to be a griddle master to work the griddle and expedite, right? So we, we have a lot of very talented people within the castle, and our castles are set up so the customers can see what we do, because they're always impressed with the speed and how our, how our team members can perfect what they're doing. But when I go back to our mission of creating memorable moments, standing there managing those baskets, there's nothing memorable about that for, memorable about that for the team member and or the customer. So again, it's getting that team member more customer facing so that we can create memorable moments. Absolutely. So I'm gonna talk about a missed opportunity. Um, we do IoT, and this is gonna be the idea of AI IoT. So IoT again, Internet of Things, um, Gen 1 IoT, which many restaurants have, and you won't know you have it until I remind you of what it is, would be that you have your freezers connected to the internet to let you know if there's a problem, or you have your utilities connected to the internet. Those are all generation one IoT. They tend to be very specialized and about a particular thing. In our particular case, we have a lot of IoT around food safety. Yeah, so we partner with Ecolab in many, many fronts, but we, have, we use K-Protect to help us make sure we, that keeps us safe, and so that's where we utilize probably the IoT the most when I think of um, a partner that we've been, we partner with. So what are we missing? If you look at the lessons from manufacturing, most major manufacturers, everything, every machine is connected to the internet now. It, because we're looking for reliability of the machine, trying to predict downtime, it's a lot of money to them. They cannot be down. We can't be down either. Our griddles can't go down. 
right, predictability, but it's also getting the information about what's being used and not used. And so for us, our lesson is gonna be, you know, we tell our team members how to run castles, but when we go to understand why we're slow or why we've had a problem or why we've had bottlenecks, it's hard for us to know because we are not connected. So imagine a, a, a restaurant, the connected restaurant, where every door, all equipment, every loop detector is connected. Remember that thing where I said you guys are gonna run a lot of cables for me? That's where you're at. So what would AI be in that part? AI in that part would be, that's a lot of data, Susan. That's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous amount of data. The reason why everyone specialized in their own fields for IoT was because they knew that there was a need that needed to be met that was not being met. Does not mean that there's not more data out there. Kind of like when we first started off in the beginning of restaurants where we collected our basic metrics and we've grown and we've grown, the buildings are growing. Everything in the building's data and we have to have that data. So why does operations want to have this data, Michael? Yeah, it's, it's so interesting because when Susan and I were talking about this, it brought back a conversation. So um, our COO and I were in Orlando and our CEO was with us and we were talking about when should we open another griddle or when should we open up another line, right? How, how do we educate our, our crew managers, the entry level crew manager that's running the shift or the general manager on, on how and when to open a line or another griddle? And so having this technology to be able to say, you need to set another grill based on the volume, based on the demand, you need to set another grill. You need to come off that line and bring all your team members to one line. That's true technology that we can take our, our management and our team members to the next level because it's more than I think I feel. It's watched this pattern, it's watched this history. So for us to be able to take that and implement that at the castle level, That'll be huge for us. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it for our version of a restaurant, when we have a bottleneck, which a lot of times sets up in speed of service, we don't know if it's capacity because they haven't set griddles. They've ran out of capacity on the griddles they've had. There's not enough. We know how many people there are there, but we don't know what they're doing. We don't know if they're on the floor. So being able to understand more of what the equipment's doing is really important for the future to be able yeah. to debug that stuff. So technology that IoT is using is extremely simple. Extremely simple. It's still the same as Gen 1. You're just trying to get the data to the internet. The tools on the other side tend to be the AWSs of the world, the Azures of the world, that have the big engines that actually find your insights for you. And that's why they tend to be the partners in that part of the field. And I think just the example that I gave about Griddle and how we use our Griddles, I thought it was a, really, it was a great comment for the crew manager to say, you know, Julia on night shift is great, but man, she just kept taking orders and taking orders and taking orders. And so for us, that's a lesson, right? Well, the same customers were coming, but were we putting them on hold? Versus Julia just keeps taking orders every time you cross, cross the loop detector. We solved the problem for them and for the company. And I suspect our sales are probably gonna be higher and the customer experience, customer experience is going to be better because Julia, Julia just keeps taking orders and we just keep fulfilling the orders. Right. And imagine if we could have that on our griddles and in our fryers and just all equipment to make that crew manager's job and general manager's job just a little bit easier. Absolutely. Very exciting. So one of the last ones is computer vision. You know, cameras are everywhere. You know, I'm sure there's probably cameras in this room, we just can't see where they're at. And, you know, but, but they've always been kind of a neutral thing. They've been something that you looked at later on. A human had to look at it. So what is computer vision in our industry? You know, I have a picture on the right-hand side. This is not something we're doing. This is something that's interesting to me. And it's cameras that are already in our parking lots, but they're looking at cars to let us know how long a car's been there at a certain time. For us in QSR, it would be how many cars are behind the menu board in the stack. Those would be different ways you would use it. And it's not a person having to look at it. It's a computer, and they can send alerts. They can let you know when things have gotten too high. It can create new metrics for us. It could do so many different things. A lot of computer vision is being used in loss prevention in retail now. For those of you who cross over to the retail space, you might already know this. We're looking for certain behaviors from people. You know, they're just behaving in a very odd way. I mean, if, if you would look at a video of people walking through a retail establishment, let's pretend like a target, the behavior is very normal, right? The abnormal behavior shows itself and computer vision could detect it. So the technology really just to you will look like a lot of cameras with a lot of equipment that seems very expensive to you and a huge bunch of data going out of the building because normally it's gonna be interpreted somewhere else. Susan mentioned computer vision in kind of a car stack, and so we measure our speed of service by crossing the loop detector, us taking your order, and then by us bumping the order when we hand, the, hand your food out. As a customer, you view your experience the minute you pulled in that line. So if you're five cars back, that's when, that's when your experience started. 
And so for us to have that knowledge to truly understand how long customers are waiting, I, th I, I know it'll help us make decisions differently. Yeah. And the lessons learned we incorporating this into the restaurants is, you know, we design our restaurants for beauty, not always for cameras hanging everywhere. So we're still working through this. So as those of you in that part of the industry are thinking about this, we need beautiful ways to have cameras everywhere, apparently. So we're going to give you some problems that we think are facing all of us, um, as since we're all on this same mission together of having amazing restaurants and incorporating technology. And then we're going to tell you some things that you need to solve. So Michael and I cannot solve it for you. Even though we have those four boxes covered, we're not you guys. So the, do you want to have the first one? The yeah. first one is problem is the idea, if you know for years, Anybody who's afraid of, familiar with the back of house, we've designed our back of houses to have as little people motion as possible. The less people have to travel, the better, the better it is for them to get to their equipment, to cook their food. Even the highest end restaurant people will be frustrated if they have to run to the refrigerator all the time. Everything's out of their way. Clear back to our QSR side where we're real tight on the spaces we allow people to be in. But we've done that permanently. We right. built real tight, narrow spaces, and we need automation. We're going to have more MISO robotics coming in. When I talk to my to the engineering team and the construction team, we talked we talk a lot about the the aisle width and the spaces and how long have we built this castle? And we're a hundred plus year old brand, and oftentimes it's this is what we always build, right? And it's just no longer working for us. Um, we have a, what we call the kitchen, the future, which for us probably has too many steps. Right, castle, when we take down a castle and we build in this new kitchen of the future, the team members, we have a lot of longevity within our company. When the team members get to go in the new castle, they're like, wow, that's a lot of moving. It's a lot of walking. Um, what I'd like to talk about here is really the need for, and it really kind of surfaced very apparently for us, is we want to install Flippy in many castles. We want to kind of roll with Flippy and just really get him out there because he's, he's proving to be a good investment for us. But every time we want to do a construction, we have to change the hood in so many of our castles because the hood's too low or it needs to be shifted to the right or to the left. And so we need, for our castle of the future, we need flexibility, right? We, need, we don't know what's gonna be here two, five or 10 years from now. We need, and this might sound strange, but I need to be able to shift that hood Three, let's say three to six inches up, down, or left to right, which means the HVAC needs that same flexibility, and our counters need that same flexibility. I'm not talking where a team member could easily move a counter, but we need flexibility within our restaurants that help us adapt to the future, and right now we just don't have that. We build the same castle, we move some counters, we, move, we create um, longer walkways, but we're just not where we need to be with our technology and the customer experience. Yeah, and even if you, you're working for a chain right now that isn't in robotics, they will be. There'll be something. You're going to be surprised by it if, if you're not part of that side of the conversations right now. But it will be something, and they will come into your lanes, right? We got tight lanes already. It, real quick on that, if you are not already in robotics and you do agree that it's coming, I suggest you can do it sooner than later, because this Mesa Robotics is three years in the making. And we have Flippy and we have Flippy in 10 castles. And the AI with, with Julia, that's three years in the making. And she's now entering her third castle. Um, we're excited that she's in Miraville, Indiana, that that region, we could basically take her now and roll her out because the menu is the same in that whole region. We just have to look at the price structure. And she should be able to perform at her same cadence that she's currently performing. But we're about to go to St. Louis and that's uncharted territory for us. So we'll probably have to enter slow, get her into shorter hours and extend that. But if you're thinking about robotics or AI and you're currently not investing or having the conversations, it's gonna take a lot longer than you anticipate based on what we've learned. Absolutely. Another thing we have, we all, all of us have in common is we're all trying to control costs. Um, but sometimes we, we have to consider the capacity of our buildings is also something that we have to control. You know, I told you about the people that don't set the griddles when the griddles are there waiting to be set. Those are more customers not being served um, by not having them set. So the idea of having a connected AI solutions for all of our equipment is very important. What does that mean? Please build me a web of walls that have cabling abilities everywhere. I don't know why you're all building before me, but for us. And, and thinking about tunnels, web tunnels, things like that to actually allow 
the flexibility of your space is to change, not just the size, but also the walls and the infrastructure. Think of your buildings as a highway on the outside with lots of infrastructure in the future that's coming. Another one, and we got, Michael and I are running a short of time, so we're gonna go faster. This is our last big slide, though. I mean, another problem is we all have labor shortages. I mean, it doesn't even matter who's in the audience right now. You have, you've had a certain point of turnover in the last couple of years or shortages that your, your operation side of your business has definitely felt if you're on the restaurant side. Julia and something like that, really, we have to go in this direction. We can't always wait and hope that the next generation is going to produce a lot of children that are willing to come and work for us and grow up with us and our companies. And so voice hire is coming. It's very noisy outside. When we, I first started a voice project with Google, like I would say eight or nine years ago, they approached me and said, we're interested in doing voice on the inside. And I said, well, we want to be on the outside. We're QSR. And they said, outside? But here's where you guys come in. For those of you who are outside designers, thinking about voice barriers, thinking about staggering the lanes, those are all things you guys could be considering to help us with our noise. If, if we're going to put a drive through in front of our building, which we have one of them, Wow, that's a lot of noise. And, it, and it's, not, it's never been good for the customer's conversation with the team member to begin with. We were already discounting it. It just became really apparent when you add AI in. So those are different things for you to consider. And then the last one is labor shortages. You know, people hate, so people think kiosks are going to solve labor shortages. And I'm going to tell you right now, as a software person, people hate kiosks, all right? It doesn't matter how good the kiosk is, they hate them. Because you're asking them to walk into every establishment and relearn new software. If you give them a value, like closing every lane down except that, yes, they will go and use it, but begrudgingly. And that's not the experience that we want. So what's going to happen next? Voice is coming inside. How can you help with that? It needs to be more of an intimate conversation than it is on the front counter. People do not like, they're a little bit, of, they need a little bit more coziness. They can't, we can't stack all of our kiosks next to each other and think they're all going to be comfortable speaking directly to this thing where a person's three inches away from them. So as you think about kiosks in the future, think about coziness, think about moving them around, think about, think about the customer and the experience that they're gonna have talking to. And once it goes to voice and you could walk up to a kiosk and order as easily as you do with for voice, that's when the kiosks finally will take off. Will kick off. Now that was our presentation. I finished exactly on time. But now we have so little time for questions, I believe. Yeah, we might have. Just time for one or two if uh, anybody has something. Oh yeah, there we go. So with the addition of Flippy and all of these AI devices in your restaurants, what's happening to your square footage in the back of the house? Because I can only imagine that, you know, maybe, let's say you were at 1,250 square feet, are you now doing 3,000 square foot back of house? Actually, no, so, you know, Flippy is, the AI in the drive-through takes up no, doesn't take up any of our square footage. So that that's a that's a non-issue. Flippy at the fryer, from where we started to where we are, continues to shrink in, in size. So other than us really doing construction to allow the flow of food to come the same way and allow for Flippy's barrier and hardware, there's not a lot of um, construction that has to take place. He doesn't come in the aisle, so we have enough space for team members. Our goal, our goal for the flexibility would be to reduce the downtime. I mean, we're down for yes. a few days when we do this. Yeah. So this is not, we don't want that. Yeah. And we don't want that over and over again as we introduce, think of it as a new, every time you had to have a new appliance installed, you had to take your restaurant down. That is not, that's not functional. Right. So we need to, we need to do good better than that. Right, and honestly, that, that ownership is really, the MISO team is really there 48 hours from the time they get into the time they go live. Our construction piece is the one that's taken us five, six days that we're losing that we're losing sales. And so it's how do we continue to chip away at that so that we're down three days and back up. That's Wonderful. And look, as you can see the slide up here, tomorrow there's going to be a deep dive uh, with Susan and Mike. Uh, if you want to ask any more questions, you can feel free to join them there for that. Um, and look, we are just wrapping up, but just quickly, it was interesting to see you guys say how long it takes to roll something out. You know, three years for Julia, three years for robotics. Uh, I guess from what you're seeing in the industry in general, like you know, your session was, are you ready? Do you see other chains investing in and experimenting as much as you guys are? In terms Absolutely. Of this? Absolutely, especially in the last two years. So everybody kind of got shocked by COVID. So 2020 was, we were already doing it in 2020. So 2020 was pretty much only a couple of chains that were heavily doing it. You guys probably heard McDonald's was doing, the, like the conversational AI, um, Chipotle on the Dippy, 
I don't know if they really call it chippy. Chippy, chippy. thank you. I call it chippy. Yeah. Makes chips for them. Um, but people have really gone on. So I would say that of all our main competitors, most of them are now in the same lanes that we are looking. But, um, but to different, that, different levels, some of them just starting. Yeah. To that point, um, like Chipotle and Jack in the Box have joined Miso Robotics, as well as several companies. But we are currently Miso's largest customer because it just takes that long to really get what you need within your restaurant or your brand. Everybody, Susan and Mike, thank you so much.